Hello, everyone, and welcome to Africa Fire Mission's weekly virtual training session. My name is Mike. I'm a project coordinator here with Africa Fire Mission. We're so happy you guys took time out of your busy schedules to come and join us for this week's training. Uh, with us today, we've got Howard Cohen. Howard is Africa Fire Mission's uh, virtual training coordinator. So he uh, gets all this set up and running for us with our weekly virtual training sessions. He also does a lot of instructing for us as well. Uh, we're so happy to have him here with us today. Uh, he's going to begin a, a, a series uh, we're doing on fire behavior. Uh, if you stick around for at least 70% of today's training, which is usually about 40 or 45 minutes, um, we will uh, uh, issue you a certificate of attendance uh, for today's training. Uh, keep an eye in the chat. Uh, I'll be placing some links in there where you can get to our Google Drive, uh, where we'll have uh, a recording of today's training session. And if you lose your connection or something like that, you need to go back. You don't can't stay for long enough. Uh, you can answer a few questions about the training there, and you'll receive a certificate of attendance for that as well. Uh, before we get started with today's training, uh, I'm going to pass things over to Jose. Jose is Africa Fire Mission's uh, 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 fire safety uh, 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 advocate, and uh, he's going to share a few words of encouragement with us. Take it away, sir. Oh, you're muted. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you so much, Chief Mike. And I'm so excited to have uh, Howard around. And uh, I'm excited about this year. And uh, even as we get started, I was just trying to think. It's the second week of the year. And the uh, second week of the year is a big deal. Why? For me, I, I usually go like, wow, I have 12 months free spaces, yeah? And I can just be able to do just about anything on it, yeah? And uh, by that, I, what I mean is, since you have 12 months ahead of you, yeah, before 2024 is over, what plans do you have, yeah? What is your why for this year? Why did I step into 2024? What do I need to accomplish? So what you need to do is to sit down on the 12 months and just jot down. Of course, don't forget your birthday in the sense that if your birthday falls in February, for example, you'll say, hey, I'm going to celebrate my birthday X, Y, and Z on doing stuff, all right? But then it is very important that you get to plan so that you don't get your plans, somebody planning for you, yeah? You're going to be somebody's agenda. So tell yourself, this year, it is going to be my agenda and I'm, I have my own goals to meet. But then also in my firehouse, I'm planning these uh, matters for me to do. For example, I plan to uh, exercise more. I plan to reach out to more people. We plan to eat more healthy in a firehouse. So it is very important that you get to plan so that somebody doesn't plan for you. Thank you so much. Back to you, Chief Mike. Thank you so much, Jose. We always appreciate you and the work that you're doing for all the firefighters really uh, throughout Africa. Uh, just a few more uh, notes if you wanna stick around after today's uh, training has concluded the top of the hour, uh, we'll be having a tea time that's gonna be hosted by Jose. And I think we have a, a guest that's uh, coming to speak about uh, insurance. Uh, so stick around, I invite you to uh, stick around for that presentation uh, as well. Uh, without further ado, then, I suppose uh, I'm going to pass things over to uh, Howard to get us started for the day. Good afternoon, everybody. Give me a second here to share my screen. And uh, let's see. Okay, I think we're ready to go. So uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to be teaching uh, this again this year. And and volunteering also with uh, Africa Fire Mission and working with Mike and Nancy and Jose. Um, so just a little background for those of you who are new to me. Uh, I retired from a volunteer fire department about um, four years ago. I was there with, with them for 20 years. I actually started as a chaplain. Um, and um, when I said, well, I'll be a chaplain, but, you know, I want to get trained. And they said, okay. Uh, and 20 years later, I retired as a deputy chief. I still was the chaplain as well, but uh, 
that was that. And so the other thing I want to tell you is that uh, uh, I became a, a grandfather this past year. My, my, I have two daughters. My middle daughter uh, had a had her um, had a baby, and uh, they live in Tel Aviv. And I have another daughter who, between me and you guys, because she's keeping it quiet in the home front, is expecting a, a child. A child uh, actually, any day now. So that's me. A little bit about my back about my background. Um, and I do want to say, as Mike did, I want to thank all of you for being here, giving up uh, time this afternoon. I know if you had a long day or you're looking at a long shift or, you know, you just got a lot going on. So I really appreciate what you're, that you're here. I don't want to make your time that you're here worthwhile. I also want to thank you for your service as firefighters and first responders in your communities. Um, it's, um, you know, it's it's an often under under recognized under uh, recognized uh, service that we provide because we do so much more than than fight fires as firefighters. So thank you to all of you for your work and for being here today. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is a uh, is an it basically it's fire firefighting fire dynamics or fire behavior 101. And I want to emphasize that it's a this is really kind of a an introduction into uh, fire the fire dynamics uh, i'm i'm pleased to say that cyrus is uh, is scheduled to follow up with more advanced uh, fire behavior in the next couple of sessions which is like it's just an ideal you know setup because before you get to the advanced stuff you want to make sure you've got your your foundation um, set and for some of you this is going to be review and so I, I hope it's worthwhile and for some of you, it might be some new information or something you hadn't really been taught uh, in your fire training. So I, um, I think we can kind of get be it could be useful for whether you're an experienced firefighter uh, with a lot of training or uh, someone who's brand new to this game. I do want to also say on that note that uh, when I was uh, initially getting trained, I remember one of the instructors saying your most dangerous time as a firefighter is about four to five years in. Why? He said, because, you know, the first few years, you get all this new information, you know, and it's right there, you're thinking about it, but because we do a lot of other things besides fighting fires, we don't, we sometimes start to forget stuff. So you get to about five years in, you've forgotten a lot of stuff, don't realize you've forgotten it, and you get overconfident. So for some of you who've already been around for a while, it's, it's, there's a value to going back to the basics. So what I'm going to cover in this uh, webinar is uh, basically what is fire definition of fire. Um, I'm going to explain uh, what's called the heat transfer. I'm going to explain uh, fire flow. Then I'm going to demonstrate how smoke is fuel. So at the end of this course or this ses this today's session, you will have a basic understanding of fire dynamics. This will provide you with the foundation for learning about reading smoke dangers such as flashovers and interior, and it help you with interior fire suppression and rescue work, because you have to understand fire dynamics in order to do any of that other stuff. And in addition, if you're gonna be doing any fire investigation, trying to determine causes of fire in your, in your fire districts, understanding fire dynamics is critical to that as well. So what is fire dynamics? Well, definition of it, it is the study of how fires start, spreads, and develops. As you can understand from that definition, it's something that matters a lot to us as firefighters. So when the so when you really get when you dive down a little bit deeper, fire dynamics is the study of the chemistry that that's involved in producing fire and sustaining fire. It's understanding um, the material sciences, how things burn. Why do they burn? What burns faster? How do they? How much heat do they give off? Um, and so there's just a lot to understand about the nature of fire that uh, is really important to us as firefighters, and that's what fire dynamics is and fire study of fire behavior. <clears throat> so at the end of the day, there's there's three basic reasons why you really need to understand fire dynamics. Never mind what I said in the beginning about it being the foundation for all the other kinds of stuff you need to do. We wanna know, we need to understand fire dynamics for these three reasons. Number one, to keep ourselves safe on the fire ground. And by the way, uh, parenthetically, that means also keeping our, our fellow firefighters safe because we need to be able to be watching out for them just as they need to be watching out for us. Number two, it's to save lives, okay? To save our own lives. It's to save our, our, our colleagues' lives. 
but just as importantly, it's to save the lives of the people we may who may be caught in the fire. You know, because you will understand fire dynamics, you might look at a building and say, wait, there could be someone just inside that room, even though fire is pouring out the window, whereas someone else who's a not a firefighter, who's a civilian might look at that and go, no way anyone can survive that. But you, with your knowledge of fire dynamics, might see that there's little survivable space inside that building, despite what it looks like from the outside. And third and finally, our, um, we want to understand fire dynamics in order to save property. And that doesn't just mean, you know, being able to put water on the fire to put it out. It means recognizing that the way heat transfer happens, for example, radiation, which we'll talk a little bit more about, can, can pass from a burning building to the building next door. So understanding that and realizing that tells you that you need to do something to save that property before it catches fire. So at the end of the day, if you don't understand the dangers you face as a firefighter, you won't know if or when you are in danger. So that's why this is so important. I want to show you a short video that it, it's kind of humorous, but it'll give you some background and a little bit about the physics of fire. Mid 1800s, Michael Faraday gave a series of Christmas lectures for kids at the Royal Institution in London. And one of his favorite subjects to talk about was fire. Faraday was particularly interested in candles because inside their delicate flames, they hold some amazing lessons on how fire really works. Like you might have seen fire described like this in chemistry class, but the chemical formula doesn't explain what fire is any more than a recipe explains what chocolate chip cookies taste like. The first thing we notice about a candle flame is all those colors. Hot things glow because of black body radiation, which we talked about in our video about the color of the universe. But down at the bottom of the flame, it's hotter, so it glows blue. In the middle, it's a little cooler, so it glows yellowish orangish. Inside of that flame, there can be hundreds of chemical reactions taking place. The oxygen in the air and the carbon and hydrogen in the candle, they don't do anything on their own. It takes a little outside heat to get things started. The solid fuel is vaporized by the heat and ripped into smaller chunks. This is called pyrolysis, and you can't have a flame without it. You can sometimes see a dark cone around the wick where there's no fire. That's where vaporized wax is coming off the candle, but it hasn't started to burn yet. When the hydrocarbons and oxygen in the air slam into each other, and their atoms begin to rearrange. Sometimes electrons in those atoms get into an excited state. When they come back down again, they give off light. That's why the bottom of the flame glows blue. Not all the carbon in the candle gets converted to CO2, so leftover carbon atoms come together and form tiny particles of soot, which heat up and glow orange and yellow like the hot coals under a grill. This glowing soot is where most of a candle's light comes from. Eventually, at the tip of the flame, all the soot is burned away, and we're left with only carbon dioxide and water floating off into the air. You can investigate all the different parts of a flame for yourself with just a cold piece of metal. Up here, we find water vapor. In the yellow part of the flame, soot. And down just next to the wick, we can even recover unburned wax. Flames look really cool, too. They're almost hypnotic. Wait, what was I talking about? Oh, oh, right, shape. Gravity pulls cool, denser air down and makes hot air rise. And this buoyancy is what gives flames their familiar shape. But if you light a flame in zero G, say, on the space station, it'll look very different. All the chemical and quantum reactions that make a flame glow can only happen where it meets the air. So even though they look like solid cones, candle flames are actually hollow. As long as there's fuel and oxygen, flame will burn and burn. Why? It's not the molecular ripping apart that makes a flame hot. It's the formation of new molecules and new bonds is what creates heat. And that heat drives the chain reaction forward vaporizing more fuel, slamming more molecules into one another, and making the fire burn on. Our species has been gathering around fire for thousands of years, telling stories, asking questions over a flickering flame. And that's part of what helped make us human in the first place. Stay curious. 
So um, I, what I like about this video is that number one, it does a really good job of, of breaking down what fire is all about. And what I think is really cool, pardon the, uh, the, the pun here, but what I think is really interesting is that that candle that he analyzes for us and breaks it down, that's exactly what's happening in a, in a structure fire. You know, where is the bright orange flames at a structure fire? They're at the window where there's oxygen, right? Where is it hottest? At, at the center, at, at the foot of the fire where it started. And, you know, you could see all of this, you know, all the dynamics that we experience at structure fires, we could see it in miniature in, this, in a candle, which I think is a really, really great way for under, coming to understand and to teach to other people what's happening with fire if, as part of fire prevention and fire education. So I really like that, this little, this little video. So, okay, let's get down to nitty gritty. What exactly is a fire? According to the NFPA, which is our, our firefighting Bible in, uh, in North America, because NFPA says, stands for the National Fire Protection Association, it, it basically outlines about everything and anything. Uh, it offers guidelines about anything and everything in the fire service that we ought to be taking care of, looking after. They're not rules because there's really no way to enforce them, but they're pretty, pretty good recommendations. But anyway, they define fire as follow as this. A rapid oxidation process, which is a gas-based chemical reaction resulting in the evolution of light and heat in varying intensities. That was all alluded to or referenced in the video when he, he talked about this process. But let me rent put this into plain English. Fire is what happens when a substance transitions from a liquid or a solid state into a gas state that then ignites. Okay, so the important thing here is that an object itself isn't what burn, isn't what actually burns, despite what our observation tells us. What actually what's burning are the gases coming off of it, and the more the gases come off, and the more it, the, there's fire, the more it creates a chemical. Uh, it changes a chemical reaction happens that changes the product into um, basically you know something charred wood or whatever it might be. So just a little review here about, about physics. Um, things come in three forms. There are solids, like ice cubes, liquids, like water, or uh, vapors, as like in steam. So um, you know, water is unique in that it can go, it, it, it can, it can um, exist in all three stages. But what happens from, from what, what we need to understand as firefighters is that whether it's a, a solid or a liquid, like a pet petrol or some other you know, uh, um, flammable liquid, it's not going to catch fire until the vapors coming off of it reach their, their ignition point. So wood has to heat before it catches fire. Um, liquids on the ground, spilled liquids, have to let off enough gas however they're going to let it off and before they're going to ignite so that's the that's a chemical process that's happening that's important when we talk about the tetrahedron tetrahedron so also wanted to touch on this process known as pyrolysis which was also mentioned in the video it's the process by which fuel is broken down by heat to release release the latent energy stored within it so Basically, everything has energy in it. That it, that that's what it is. It's it's energy in a, like a solid form, but when that energy is allowed to be released, that's what turns into fire. So um, you see the picture of this couch. It's not on fire yet, even though the, it's red around it. But you can see all this all the smoke coming off of it. That's because it's getting hotter and hotter, and it's letting off gases. What happens when that latent energy, that, that fuel that's coming off of it in the form of vapors gets hot enough, poof, it explodes. So fuel in a solid or liquid form or liquid forms must be transformed to a gaseous state to support flaming combustion. That's what pyrolysis is. It is the, it is the chemical transition from a solid to the gas form. That's all important when you talk about the tetrahedron. 
So what that is, is that um, we used to call this the, uh, the, the fire pyramid, but now we call it the tetrahedron, tetrahedron because there's four components to it. In order for there to be fire, four things have to happen. You have to have fuel, it has to have oxygen, it has to have heat, and there has to be a chemical chain reaction. You have to have all four of those things in order to produce fire. It, originally, they left out that they, they didn't include the ch chemical chain reaction, but uh, as, as uh, materials changed and the science got more exact, we realized that there is this chemical pr process going on and um, that's necessary. That's the pyrolysis, essentially, that's necessary to actually to, to achieve, achieve fire. But here's the thing. Take away any one of these four and the fire goes out. Well, you know that from your life experience as firefighters and just your lived experience. You have a fire in a pan, what do you do? You put a lid on it, you cut the oxygen off, the fire goes out, right? Or you throw water on it, or you throw sand on it. All of these things um, are eliminating, or you, you know, either the fire burns out because there's no more fuel, or you've cooled it off with water, or you've drowned it and cut off the oxygen, or you can cut off it, you can change it by changing the chemical chain reaction. And, and, and by, at, by cutting off oxygen, you're doing that, or reducing the heat level, you're doing that. So you have to remember all four of these components are part of what produces fire. It's not just heat. It has to be fuel and there has to be oxygen. <clears throat> so to sum it up, this aspect of it, heat produces fuel vapors. Fuel vapors ignite. And when you get into a little bit more advanced level of fire behavior, there's two different flash points regarding to ignition. One is that it ignites, but the other is that it sustains ignition. We're not gonna get into that. I just wanted to mention to it. But then the more heat, more heat you have, it's now gonna promote fire growth. And then that spreads your fire. And that, that's, that's the basic fundamentals of, of what, how fire is, it, uh, happens and grows. I want to talk a little bit about something called uh, about two different category things. One is heat versus temperature. These are important to understand. Heat release is the rate or the speed at which something burning releases energy. Remember, an object has latent energy in it. And when you heat it up and it starts to burn, you're releasing the energy, right? Temperature is the measure of the heat. So increasing the heat release rate of a fire doesn't necessarily increase the temperature of the flames, but it does increase the thermal hazards because it's gonna cause more things to heat up faster and therefore spread fire. So let me give you an, an example. One candle equals 80 watts and burns at uh, 1500 degrees Celsius or Fahrenheit. I'm not really sure what it was. I didn't put that in my notes. <laughs> Sorry. 10 candles equals 800 watts, but it still burns at the same 1500 degrees. So the heat, heat rate, uh, release rate is about the heat transfer, which is more dangerous than the actual, you know, than um, the actual temperature of it. It's how fast it's letting, letting heat off like an explosion will have a pretty intense heat release rate. So you get, that's just an important thing to understand with also with fire dynamics. Okay, I know this is gonna sound like I'm, uh, you know, saying something that's obvious, but I'll, I'm gonna do it anyway. What is fuel? The answer is any substance with latent energy. I've mentioned that late energy a lot because it's important to realize that the problem for, of firefighting is that when that energy gets released, that's what keeps and sustain, that's what builds the fire and sustains the fire. And it's what sustains combustion under specific conditions. Fuel can be a solid, it can be a liquid, or it can be a gas. But fuels in solid or liquid forms 
must be transformed to a gaseous state in order to support flaming combustion. Here's a concept that's worth keeping in the back of your mind. Vaporization, it's the process by which a liquid fuel is converted into a vapor, which can ignite with the right mixture of O2 and an ignition source. Um, I don't know if you use um, uh, gas meters when you would respond to uh, certain calls, um, but you know that when you start smelling gases, the concern is that, okay, the liquid fuel somewhere is starting to turn into a vapor. What's going to take it? What's going to cause it to ignite? That's what we have to be concerned about. So the right mixture of O2 and an ignition source, kaboom, it's going to, it's going to light up. The thing is, is that that right mixture of O2 is going to be different for every kind of, of vapor. So here's the other thing I want to talk about. I've already talked about latent few energy in a product where we often forget there's a, there's a ton of latent energy is in smoke. So basically what is smoke? It's the incomplete combustion of fuel. What is fuel? Fuel is a container for latent energy. So if the smoke is basically st still has latent energy in it, then it, it can catch fire. So smoke is fuel. It's really important to remember that. I'm going to show you a couple of short videos, real short, demonstrating the, how, that, that the way in which smoke is in fact fuel uh, and can be ignited. So watch this one. Ready? Yeah, go. Watch it, watch it, watch it. Kaboom. You see how that smoke, when it reached an ignition point or had something that to ignite it, it just caught fire, just like a piece of wood or a piece of paper would. I'm gonna go back and replace it because I wanna show you something else about this. Hey, so, yeah, now, go. Now, see this smoke is pouring out now let's say you arrive at a burning house and you see smoke like this pouring out of a window okay you're noticing that and then at some point it ignites now you see flames coming out of this window and you're thinking oh my god this room is, it's got to be totally engulfed but look below and down here the bottom part of the the opening there's no fire down there the fire is up at the top where the smoke is rising, the hot, the heated fuel, that smoke is rising, it is burning. So this is a, an example of how, by understanding this, you might look at this room and go, there is maybe potential survivable space in there, which means I need to go check it to see if there's a victim in there that I can get out. It's conceivable. Just because there's a lot of flame up here doesn't mean the rest of the room is in flames. It just because that's where the heated fuel ignited is reaching the oxygen. And as we learned from that original video, the more color there is, the more the yellow just means the more oxygen there is hitting it. So one more. This is something you could do to demonstrate this show um, with people. Now watch this, the match and the candle. Watch what happens. Let me let me play this again. Watch how the flame from the match right follows the smoke back to the candle. Again, it's an example of how how fuel, how smoke is fuel. It's a great a great little exercise you could do with with uh, students or your firefighter, new firefighters, to demonstrate about the smoke is fuel. And you can also use the the experiment in the original that first video where he puts a screen in the flame to show how it's hollow in the middle and the different elements of it. Again, it's all about learning about fire dynamics. Okay, let's get into a little bit about heat transfer and why it concerns us. Heat transfer is the result of rapid molecular movement in one object causing the molecules in a cooler object to start moving faster. 
Okay, simpler English. Heat is when you, the heat goes from one object to another, right? You put your hand, you've taken your cold hand and you've grabbed a hot a pot handle, and you know that heat goes from that pot handle to your hand real fast. That's heat transfer. Heat transfer is the major factor in the ignition growth and spread and of a fire. Heat always moves from the hotter object to the cooler object. Always, that's the way it goes. Heat energy is transferred to an object, to an object increases the object's temperature, and heat energy transferred from an object decreases the object's temperature. Which is to say, when I take a, something that's hot out of a, say I put stones in a fire and I wanna put them on my leg cause it's sore or I have a hot, hot uh, you know, a hot, something hot that I wanna put on my leg, it's gonna, my, my cold leg is gonna draw the heat out. And that's what this is saying. So heat always goes from the hotter object to the cooler object. And at some point it decreases the hot objects, uh, it's a temperature. What we need to remember about the mechanisms of heat transfer are three ways in which it's transferred. I'm gonna show you some uh, 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 graphics of this, but let me just run through these real quick. You have conduction and heat transfers within solids or between contacting solids. So my hand grabs something that's hot, that's a form of conduction of heat transfer. Convection, heat transfer by the movement of liquids or gases. Okay, so hot gases are flowing through the building. They're gonna take that heat and catch another part of the building on fire. That's convection. And radiation is when the heat is transferred by electromagnetic waves. In other words, <laughs> the heat, the heat is just it is just you don't see it. It's just it's just out there, it's just radiating out. That's like when you're sitting around a campfire and it's cold and you hold your hands up against it, it's the radiation, the heat coming off. Okay, important thing to remember, in the fire environment, you are most often the cooler sub object. In other words, heat's gonna be looking for you. So you wanna be paying attention. Okay, let's look at conduction as in the context of a firefighter. <clears throat> The red spots where your hands and your knees, your toes are touching the ground, that's creating uh, heat transfer. If that floor is hot, it's gonna make you hot. By the way, I also put some lines in here I wanna point want you to draw attention to, draw your attention to. First is this black line. This black line represents what we call the neutral plane. The neutral plane is the kind of the dividing point between the inflow, that's what this blue air, this cool, cool air coming in from the outside represents, and the outflow, that's what the red line represents. Think of it this way. You have a, uh, a wood stove, and on the bottom of the wood stove, you have a, a, um, a damper. You open the damper to let cool air in, and you have a, a chimney or smokestack to let the smoke go out. That's what's happening in the building. You crawl in, you're crawling in with the cool air below the neutral plane, and the hot air is going out above your head. Convection, okay? Heat transfer through air or water. In this case, you're crawling in with the cool air again. The heat and smoke is coming off of this couch and rising and then going out. That neut neutral plane would be right here, right above where it says convection. So that's why you go in and you crawl. It's not just because it's hot up there, which it is, but it's because you want to stay below the neutral plane. So this is, this is convection, where the heat's rising. And by the way, you go back to that original video, he explained that. It's rising, it gets heavy, and then it's going to drop back down again. So as we know, that eventually, as the smoke and heat builds, that neutral plane is going to go lower and lower. And then third, we have radiation. And that's just the, the intense energy coming off. Again, neutral plane, inflow, outflow. The greatest source of radiation energy or heat, the sun, which I gather you guys are uh, 
some of you in Kenya are wishing you had more of right now because it's cold there. At least that's what Jose said. Now, the other thing you want to want to talk about with regards to um, the uh, air, the fire dynamics is airflow. Airflow is the movement of air, and it always, always goes from high pressure to low pressure. Think of the tea kettle, right? You heat up the water in the tea kettle, pressure builds, it's got to go, it's, so it, it's going to shoot out. So high pressure is always looking for a way to get out. Hot air rises because when you heat air or any other gas for that matter, it expands. When the air expands, it becomes less dense from the air around it, less dense, the hot air floats and um, floats more dense cold air and the wood and the, well, it just, the hotter it gets, the less dense it is and the more it floats like in water or um, in the air. So flow, flow path is the, is what's happening between the inlet and the outlet. And I, I have a, a, a graphic that'll show that better for that to you, show that to you. This is another basic fundamental of, of fire behavior you need to understand, the flow paths. F ventilation flow paths are buoyancy driven. That means they're, they're going to go up and down based on how hot or cool they are. And they always flow away. Flow away is typically hot and high and flow towards it is cooler and low. Okay, so as so we talked about in the earlier pictures, the cool air comes in, cool air is heavier. As it rises, it gets hot, it goes up. But as it goes up, it also cools off and starts to come back down. So it creates kind of a circular motion. Uh, total aside, you can experience this in the water. Uh, it, when you're in when you're in water and you feel cold spots and hot spots, that's the cool the cold spots or the cold water from down below rising above the the uh, uh, the, the more dense warm water. Interesting ecological phenomenon. All right, so back to um, you know understanding how the fire what happens when fires the, the fire flow. Once again, sorry for the what seems like repetition, but really got to get this down in order to be safe. You come in with the cool air, it's going to rise and goes out. This is called a bi-directional flow on the bottom. That means it's coming in one way and it's going out a, uh, it's going out a different way uh, up, up, up above. So it's coming around kind of making this circle. A unidirectional one, um, which sounds almost like they're, they have the, the namings wrong, but it's the way it is, it flows in and then it flows out. And so it's going in the same direction. So it's really the operational term is it's, it's moving in the same one direction. That's why it's unidirectional. Flow in, flow out. Flow in, but flowing out the same way it came in. So this raises a couple of issues. When you talk about um, um, venting, entering, um, isolating, and searching, the VEIS model, why do we say it's so important to close the door or isolate? Because when you close this door, you shut off that hot air flow, you cut off that, you reduce that circulation, and it keeps the, uh, the fire from getting, from feeding the fire. Um, so, um, and the same for up here. You close the door, right? You close, close the door of the window, you go in, and now it, it cuts down the, the, uh, the flow, which gonna help to reduce the fire. So, Kind of winding down, <clears throat> really covered the basics here. I'm going to review them in just a second. Um, I want to show you one more quick video. I think it just kind of pulls some of these pieces together um, and um, raises some questions. Um, like I have a question for you. <clears throat> are you familiar with the term air entrainment? If you are, uh, put it in the chat. Yes, I know what air entrainment is. <clears throat> Let's see if anybody's responding. Air entrainment, 11 new messages. Let's see. Nope, not sure anybody's responding. So let me just tell you, air entrainment is when you basically are forcing the air to move in a direction you want it to go. So that's important when you're doing, uh, you know, fire suppression. 
whether you're doing it from an interior position or an exterior position. Something for you to think about is that what are you most likely to do? You might be an exterior firefighter, so you know you're not going to do interior, but that doesn't mean you need, don't need to pay attention to what happens with what you're doing with your hose and the water. So let's watch this video real quick. A good incident action plan involves an understanding of where the fire is located and where it is spreading. Fire gases and heat will move from an area of higher pressure, typically where the fire is, to an area of lower pressure. This path of smoke and heat spread is known as the exhaust portion of the flow path. In a structure fire, a flow path exists between the fire and an area of high pressure and any adjacent room, hall, stairway, open door, or window that connects to an area of lower pressure. During fire suppression, firefighters have the opportunity to take advantage of how water streams can alter this flow of smoke and heat. In some instances, it is advantageous to alter the flow. For example, during an interior attack when there is a vent opposite the advancing hose crew. In training as much air as possible with the hose stream creates pressure that can push the products of combustion ahead of the advancing crew. In other instances, for example, during an exterior water application, it can be more effective to cool and knock back the fire using streams and nozzle handling techniques that limit air entrainment and pressure buildup. This limits the impact on the flow path and allows the exterior vent to continue to function as an exhaust vent. Flow path and fire suppression must be thought of together. Knowing how and when to alter the flow path makes for a more effective and safer fire attack. Sums it up. When you're talking about interior or exterior firefighting, you just, that, that last little video brings it all together in terms of why the, all the understanding of these basics is so important. Uh, so one last example of uh, smoke as fuel. I don't think you can, um, you know, just worth hearing it over and over. 25 what? years ago, when I began my fire service career, fire instructors used to say, never put water on smoke. We know that's not the case today. We know that smoke is fuel. Smoke is primarily made up of carbon monoxide, which is highly flammable and even combustible. The smoke being given off here is, is uh, still within its flammable range. I just think it's worth, it's, it's a lesson we need to remind ourselves of, smoke is fuel. All right, let me just wrap everything up here. Heat is always transferred from the hotter object to the cooler object, which is typically you in a fire situation. Flow path can either be bi-directional, which is to say it kind of going and goes in and out the same place, or unidirectional, meaning it's going in like a more or less of a straight line. Airflow is always high pressure to low pressure. Fuel, any fuel is, is material that has stored energy in it, latent energy in it that can be released through a chemical process, generally facilitated by heat. Water absorbs the energy and heat that results in fire uh, really, really effectively. It's important to control the door in order to affect the flow path and the amount of oxygen getting into a space. And lastly, if you're doing interior work, then you do not want to vent until you are ready with water. So uh, that kind of wraps things up. Uh, and I think that I will just say in, fine, in closing, um, my two favorite quotes, we don't rise to the occasion, we fall back on our training. And lastly, no matter the situation, look for the gift and opportunity it offers you. And on that note, uh, I will say um, uh, thank you for listening. I hope that this was a helpful review or good new information for you for the first time around. And I hope that I've also laid a great foundation for Cyrus, who will go, who uh, I anticipate will be going deeper in the in uh, fire behavior in the next couple of sessions. Lastly, in the uh, video, and I guess you know we can put this in the chat. This is a link to a to a site that's got uh, great training potential opportunities and it's uh, they're free. So let me, I'll just put this in the chat. You can, you can try, um, you can, 
And then uh, on that, I will say, um, let me just put that in here. There you go. And that's a link to some great training information, uh, training resources. Uh, and, and I'm going to then uh, quit my share the screen and say thank you again for attending. And I'll turn it back to Mike and Jose. Thank you very much, Howard. We always appreciate you. Uh, that was a lot of uh, really good knowledge you passed along there. At this point in time, we want <clears throat> to open the floor up uh, for some questions. If there's any questions out there, uh, we'll adjust our settings here so that you can unmute yourself. Uh, if you've got a question, you can place it in the chat. You can use the raise hand feature, uh, or you can just unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question. So. Uh, now's the time if you've got any questions about this uh, uh, fire behavior session. Now's the time to ask. Looks like we have one question. Oh, no. So let me ask you guys a question while you're while you're thinking about your own questions. My question for you is that um, what's a situation that, that you found yourself in where um, you were confused by what the fire was doing? You ever had that situation? Mm, okay. You know, some of those, uh, <clears throat> the concepts that you talked about that I think are really important for some of these guys is that concept of those flow paths and uh, the the discussion about using that, that combination of that fog nozzle um, to, with, with your discussion of air entrainment and how we can use that pattern to sort of pressurize the room and get that smoke flowing in a different direction uh, could be a really critical piece of information uh, for someone who's going to try to execute a rescue or begin their suppression uh, without the use of a breathing apparatus. All right. We know there's a lot of um, uh, situations where guys don't have access to, uh, to proper breathing apparatus. So we talk a lot about some of these interior firefighting techniques, and sometimes guys will think, you know, we can't use those. But there, there's a situation where especially when we're talking about executing a rescue. A lot of times research has found that, uh, that your victims are located, you know, uh, you know, within uh, maybe two or three meters of, of a doorway or a window or something like that. So using, uh, using that hydraulic ventilation technique or trying to manipulate that flow path uh, of the fire to change that direction of smoke can give you maybe those couple meters that you need to, to duck inside and to get that sort of quick search of areas near windows, areas near uh, uh, entry doors um, that you might not otherwise have been able to access. So I think that was really a great, um, a great piece of information that you shared there. Let, let me add, let me dovetail on that, Mike, and say that uh, um, in that same vein, um, flames coming out of the window doesn't mean that there might not be um, a victim lying on the floor below below the neutral plane where the flame you know where the flames are coming out so again um you know how you get to that person might might be through a different access point but it's and it goes to the fact that understanding the fire behavior um helps you better understand what's going on in the structure Absolutely. And that, that concept of that neutral plane, if you can visualize that neutral plane and you can see that clear delineation between the smoke and the clear air underneath of it, um, that's our area, once again, where, we're, where we can get in there to do some operation without that breathing apparatus, staying below that neutral plane and watching that to see what it's doing. Is that neutral plane rising? Is that neutral plane lowering down on top of us and, and working in that safe space underneath of there, or I should say that relatively um, safe space yeah. underneath there when you need to to try to do some operations, um, <clears throat> you know, without a BA or something. So uh, 
I look forward to us uh, expanding on our on this uh, behavior and getting a little bit different perspective um, over the next few weeks here. Uh, again, I'll ask if there's any uh, questions, comments, or any discussion uh, with regards to today's topic. Um, go ahead and, and, and place it in the chat, or you can unmute yourself and uh, raise your hand something. If there's any uh, any questions, we'd be happy to try to answer and address those yet. Uh, good day, everyone. Hello. How are you? I am well, I'm... thank you for joining us. Yep, it's a very interesting topic uh, on, on fire behaviors and especially on the part which you have mentioned back home in Africa. Uh, we do not have most of the resources. So sometimes the way we fight the fire is due to the experience that we have in the behavior of the fire. Um, we might not have the thermal imaging camera, but as we approach uh, an incident where we, have a, we want to identify the seat of fire, we might use an experience of um, the sound which is produced by the fire depending on the stage at which it will be. A most thing we look into when we're talking about fire behavior is the stages of fire. You can be able to identify which stage of fire is it at um, by the sound it produces. Uh, uh, trying to look at the hazards that may be encountered during that scenario of um, uh, backdraft, smoke explosion, and also we might be able to 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 investigate to get if the fire is still present by the mumbling sound that may be produced during the smoldering uh, stage of the fire. You can understand the behaviors of the fires and the stages at which they are by the sound. Yes, we might not have the thermal imaging camera, but whatever you do, um, it's, it's not something that you can learn once you need to attend different scenes and different scenes to get to understand the language of fire and how does it present itself. Uh, if we get uh, more knowledge into that, it might, might help so much. Yeah, you're, you're, you're totally right. That, that's a great point about this, the sound that the fire makes. And, and uh, an even better point that you made is that you 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 have, you have to learn them. You, can, you have to learn sort of the academic aspect of things. It's like the the, the you know the what's and the why's, but to really understand it, you have to have you have to experience it. So there's these different stages in the learning process. It's like and you you you're totally right. I, I'll tell you a quick story about hearing the sound of fire. We had a big fire in a in a building here a number of years ago, and um, I happened to be talking to uh, a woman whose office had been really involved with it. And she said all morning long she'd heard, been hearing what she thought were the sounds of bees in the wall but in fact what it was is that the contractors had had hit a wire and the fire was built it was grow, growing in the wall but it wasn't until it, bur it, it it heated up enough to burn through that they knew that that was the fire but she didn't know because she she didn't know what this what she was hearing she's just sound like, Sound, yes. yeah so it's a really it's a really good point that, that you make and I, and I think um uh you know you also make a really good point about you know that just the you know you learn you, you know you it's like this is, my, this is my analogy you can teach somebody uh, about you can teach someone about riding a bicycle or swimming from a book and this is what you do but until you get on the bicycle or you get in the water you're not going to actually learn how to do it so it's the same with this fire you know it's like we have to understand the mechanics, the physics behind the fire behavior, but until you get into the fire scene and you see it happening, um, you know, it, that's where it all makes a big difference. So good point. Thanks for bringing that up, you, what you brought up out. You're welcome. Is there a question in the chat? No, that was me. Oh, that's you. Okay. Um, yeah, just, you know, fire, um, again, if you have a question, go ahead and interrupt me or something, but I wanted to say that, you know, understanding, you know, what we, what we intuitively know, because we all use fire, whether for cooking, for heating, you know, I mean, whatever, we're all familiar with it, but we often forget about that when we get into the, the, the fire scene, 
in part because it's like what the guy in the original video said we get mesmerized and we just like we start staring at the flames we get like we're like bugs flying into the fire because we just get it's it's pretty cool to, to look at but um you know think about situations like like stairwells and how stairwells can become chimney stacks you know for, for drawing the smoke to come you know up higher up so, you know and that's why it's so important to close doors as you go up a stairway behind you um same thing in, in an apartment building there's been some some famously horrible fires in the United States where a fire in one apartment um, spreads just just creating all kinds of havoc because it spreads through the fire down the hallway and out an open window at the other end and just creates you know a nightmare for the people there. So understanding flow path critical, understanding how to you know that sort of stuff. So yeah. So, Mike, are we still going to have tea time? Because you said there's going to be a another present presentation about insurance. Yep, yep. We'll we'll uh, we'll give one last opportunity for any questions or comments uh, on today's class, and then uh, and then we'll get started here uh, with our tea time. So, one last uh, one last chance here. Uh, at this point in time, I want to thank everyone uh, for attending today's training. We're going to wrap up the formal portion of today's training. I invite you to stick around uh, for our tea time where we do have a, a special guest to discuss some life insurance and things like that. So thank you all for taking the time out of your schedules, uh, for spending your bundles uh, to be here with us. And I hope to see you all again next week.